verse 1 through 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, but it also me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, <clears throat> today is our fourth and last sermon in the series, God Never Said That. We've been talking about some of the cultural beliefs, some of the things that people say about God or believe about God that, well, as we've been learning, God never actually said. Today what we're going to look at is maybe even one of the biggest lies that this series deals with. It's a lie that uh, has crept into not just the culture around the church, but even culture in the church sometimes. You may have heard it. You may have said it. You may even believe it, but God never said it. It's the idea that it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere. Ever heard that? It doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere. It's easy to see why this saying, or this belief has crept into our culture, though, because this is kind of a nicey-nicey thing, right? This is one of those things that really feels good. Right? Feel good theology. It's that idea that God is so big. And it's a, and this is true. God is bigger than everything that we face. He's bigger than our circumstances. He's bigger than our lives. But when we start thinking that God is so big that it, it really doesn't matter what we believe. As long as we're sincere about it, we're going to be okay. That's just feel good theology. It's not biblical, but it feels good. And so we pass on the idea. I mean, not you guys. But somebody does. Because I hear this thing all the time. And it's actually a very slippery slope to get ourselves on. Because it leads to a very dark and a very deep hole. It doesn't matter what you believe in, because all roads lead to God. It doesn't matter what you believe in, as long as you're sincere. Because, well, religions, they're all really the same. It doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere. But God never said that. And even if we're not talking about Christianity, those statements are just not true. All roads don't lead to God. All religions are not the same. We used to know a girl that believed in reincarnation. And uh, she was really sincere in her beliefs. Uh, and, and when she first brought it up, uh, honestly, I'm not sure if I thought she was was kidding or, or, or what, but we're just in the middle of a conversation, she just started talking about how she's so passionate about all things ancient Egypt, you know, she's really into it, she just feels this deep connection with, with ancient Egypt, and so she had just made this thing in her head where because she had such a deep core passion for all things ancient Egypt, she is a reincarnated Egyptian princess. Yeah, whatever. I mean, no, people, people believe all kinds of things, but she would bring this stuff up when the crowd, people were all hanging out, a bunch of us friends were all hanging out, and she would start talking about this thing, and she's like, no, like, really, it's who I am, and so I've come to realize, this is her thinking process, I've come to realize that uh, I, I'm this reincarnated Egyptian princess, because that's where my passions lie, and of course, the Dungeons and Dragons guy's like, oh, yeah, because, yeah, and I was a knight in the Middle Ages, and you know, and then you got the, the the girl that's all into the civil rights stuff, and she's like, "Oh, and I and I was a, a, a you know a wealthy plantation owner who was secretly part of an underground railroad movement," and and I'm like, yeah, "I guess I must have been a big bowl of chicken wings." <laughs> so, and, and I'll be honest, I, w I was a little bit. I'm just making this face, going like, "Come on, really?" But people believe things when they believe other things. Sometimes what we believe, in fact, I think all the time what we believe matters incredibly much because of what it leads to. Anyway, the common belief in our culture today is that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, and at least that's what some people say. 
But how they react sometimes says something very different to me. So I know a lot of people say this stuff like it doesn't matter what you believe, but then how they behave indicates something very different. How most people behave indicates that deep down inside, I think all of us get that it really does matter what you believe. Let me explain what I mean by that. See, in our culture today, basic spirituality, that's not controversial. It's not. You can talk about God. You can talk about God anywhere you go. I don't know. There's this idea, I think, inside the church where people feel like you can't go and talk about God anywhere because people get upset. Well, that's just not true. You watch TV? You ever seen a sporting event? You ever watch the interviews after the sporting event? Everybody gives credit to God. You watch the Academy Awards or the Grammys or any of those shows? They get up there to receive their award, and the first thing they do is they thank God. You can go on a daytime talk show, and you can talk about higher power all you want. You can do it all day long, and nobody bats an eyelash. In fact, nobody gets upset until you mention the name of Jesus. Then people get upset. That's interesting to me. What's even more fascinating to me is that nobody really debates the existence of Jesus. Even people that are just radically against Christianity don't debate the, in, the existence of Jesus Christ. They don't. They'll acknowledge all day long that Jesus was a very real person. What's also very interesting to me is that even people who just absolutely hate Christianity, they call themselves atheists, they're all about bashing down faith, in fact, people of any faith, even those people love the teachings of Jesus. Right? They connect so deeply with what Jesus teaches. I mean, who doesn't help the poor, love others, be generous, forgive the people that hurt you. I mean, his teaching is phenomenal. It's incredible, and everybody knows it. Even if you hate Christianity, it's kind of, it's almost impossible to hate the teaching of Jesus. So even those people who are completely against Christianity don't debate his existence, and most of them embrace his teaching, or most of it. You see, it's really hard to question the power and beauty of Jesus' teaching, but people get so upset about his name when you bring his name into things. And, they, and the reason for that is because of the one exclusive claim that Jesus makes. It's what makes everything different about him. John 14 and 6, when Thomas, one of the disciples, didn't know where they were going. You heard the scripture this morning. Thomas didn't know where they were going. Jesus said, you know where I'm going and how to get there. And they said, no, we don't. And Jesus answered him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Boom. That's it right there. That's what makes people angry. That's why Jesus' name mentioned in public. That's why when you stand on a stage in front of people who are maybe not of faith and you mention the name of Jesus, they get all riled up inside. This is what upsets people. Right there. That's what set Jesus apart from all other world religions. It's the exclusive claim that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through him. So what I want to do, just for a couple minutes, before we really dig in here, I'm just going to really, I mean, just like two minutes, I want to talk about some of the other faith religions. Because remember I said, even if you take Christianity out of the equation, those statements about all roads lead to God and all religions are the same, that's not true. Not even from a secular standpoint as you examine religions of the world. So I just want to talk about this for just a second because they are not the same. So for example, Buddhism. Right? Everybody see? I don't know this guy doing the thing, right? A sitting guy, cross-legged. It's pretty neat. They have statues all over the eastern countries of the world where they worship Buddha. But Buddhism has no God. Okay? Buddhism has no final type of existence. What Buddha would believe in is countless rebirths, like reincarnation. 
So people keep coming back. They're reborn, 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 reborn. Not sure how they reconcile the fact that the population is growing, but it, it, it grows and grows and grows. But anyway, Hinduism, on the other hand, is very different. <laughs> Although both have a cross-legged guy. Right? So Hinduism has an impersonal God that's approached through statues and idols. That's how you talk to the God or relate to the God, small g, right? There is no forgiveness of sins. There's no supernatural help in this world. What, what they believe in is karma. You've heard of karma before, right? If I do something bad, something bad's going to happen to me. If I do something good, hopefully something good will happen to me, although that doesn't necessarily seem to always be the way, but that's what they believe anyway. Those are the bare, and I do mean these are just bare basic differences. This is just to show you sort of a snapshot of how these religions are different. So even those two, which some people assume are the same, are very different, aren't they? Islam is very different from both of those. You see, the Muslims, they worship a personal God, Allah. There are no secondary gods in Islam, and there is a total ban on idols. In this religion, your standing with Allah, like how you relate to Him, depends upon your religious devotion and your works. So you got to be good enough. Right? You've got to be good enough to be in right relation with Allah. That's a lot different. New Age religions? Eh, I don't know. I'm not even sure. No, I, this, this guy's got a cross-legged guy, too. Um, they believe most often in just higher consciousness, becoming one with the cosmos. And it's, it's, it, it came about with, with hippies. Remember that? You want to be at one with the universe? That's where this birthed out of. This, that's what I read. Again, it's not the same as the others. There's no personal God. There's no forgiveness of sin. There's no supernatural help. And finally, Christianity, which if you guessed it, I have a bias towards. Christianity has a personal God exposed to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. He offers Forgiveness for all of our sins, and it's not based on religious effort at all. It's based on God's goodness alone. It's His power. It's His way. Because of who He is. So when someone says it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere, an objective person would look at these facts and say, well, first of all, God never said that, and second, that just doesn't even look true. So now what I want to do is I want to take a look at all of this stuff a little bit objectively. And I want to invite you to do something this morning. I want to invite you to just, and I mean this, just consider Jesus. Just open up to possibility this morning. I'll make any assumptions about anybody here. I just want you to consider him and think through this with me. If you're taking notes, the first thing I want to ask you to do this morning is consider the ministry of Jesus. Consider his ministry. Let's look at Mark chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, which summarizes why Jesus came. First of all, we see in verse 16 that the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, when they saw Jesus eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, they were really put off. They were angry about it. Because, I mean, who would eat with those people? Righteous people don't associate with unclean people. No, no one that is actually good would be seen eating with people that are so dirty, dirty, so filthy, so full of sin. And yet Jesus did. And they were just angry. And they asked the disciples, what up? Okay, they didn't say it like that. <laughs> but then Jesus, he hears them talking. He hears them asking questions. And he said this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to, go, to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. He came for people like me. He came for people like you. Consider the ministry of Jesus. Those who were 
were despised by the culture he loved and he accepted. Those who their religions rejected, Jesus loved and he reached out to. When a woman was caught in sin, I mean caught in sin, a sin that carried with it the punishment of execution by stoning. When this woman is caught in this adultery, all the religious people said, stone her to death, kill her. That's what the law says, kill her. And Jesus looked at them and he said, okay. Whichever one of you who has no sin, who has never sinned, who is perfect and pure, go ahead. You throw the first stone. Nothing. Because we know, don't we? Apart from Christ, apart from the saving grace, we're not that good, are we? Compared to a holy and perfect God, we're just not. And so they didn't. And Jesus looked at the woman and he said, Now go your way and sin no more. Hmm. It's pretty powerful when you think about it. Think about some of the other things that Jesus did. <coughs> Jesus walked on water. Jesus healed the blind, touched their eyes and gave them sight. He, he gave hearing back to people who were deaf. He touched lepers. And, and healed them instantly. He turned water into wine. He took a few loaves and fish and fed 5,000 men and who knows how many women and children were there. Jesus raised the dead. And here's what's crazy about all this is that the critics, the critics, <laughs> they never even challenged the miracles. They saw the miracles and they never, they never argued them. They just wanted them to stop it. They, they saw the miracles. They didn't question them. They saw the validity of them. They just wanted them to stop. Stop it, they would yell. Stop it. Cut it out. Don't do that. They saw the miracles. They just wanted them to end it. Consider the ministry of Jesus. In fact, consider that the reality is the same for you and for me. Some of you are a miracle of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. I want you to hear this because this is important. This is true for all of you. Some of you are a miracle. A miracle of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Do you have the faith to believe that this morning? Many years ago, my friend Derek was sitting in that seat of that car. When it spun out of control on a, on a highway somewhere in, uh, oh my goodness, I don't know, Maine, maybe? On his way back home at Christmas vacation from college, his best friend was driving his car. Derek was in the passenger seat. They hit black ice, spun out of control, flew off the highway, slammed into an oak tree on Derek's door. Crushed the side of his head. They arrived to airlift him out, and they did not believe that they could even get him into the helicopter alive, but they did. And they didn't believe and voiced it, told the people at the site, told his friends that were being loaded into ambulances, he's probably not going to make it to the hospital. And they started to pray. <clears throat> and he made it to the hospital. One of the nurses came out to uh, talk to the parents while surgery was going on and, and told the parents flat out, you need to prepare yourself. It does not look good. The damage is incredibly severe. He is most likely not going to make it through this surgery. And they prayed. And he did. They moved him into a room and he was in a coma and the doctor surgeons came in and said there's just too much damage to his brain. He's, ne he's ne never going to recover from this. Uh, he'll be in a coma. Uh, you need to consider that and prepare yourselves for the worst. Um, I, I highly doubt he's even going to live through the night. And they prayed. And he did. He's never going to come out of the coma, they said. 
And so his friends and his family so we started to gather at the hospital. They started to pray. And he came out of the coma. And the doctor said, yeah, I get this, but he's, he's pretty much going to be a vegetable. I mean, he's, he's never even going to be able to, to speak again. So they start calling all their friends, and all those people started praying, and Derek spoke. Now this is still, I mean, this is still critical. Doctors are going, no, 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 this guy should be dead, he should be dead, there's no way. But he, now he's out of the coma, now he's, he's trying to say, well, he's making sounds anyway, he can't. But you know what, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, he's still kind of paralyzed, he's never going to be able to get up. He's never going to walk again. And a week later, he did. But he's never going to be able to function. He would consider the massive damage to his body, to his brain more specifically. You're talking of a guy that's never going to be able to speak properly again. He's never going to be able to form like actual words. Yes, he can make sounds. We get that. But that is really a miracle. They use the word miracle. But, but he's never going to like, be able to have conversation with understand that. He's never going to be able to function in society. He's never going to be able to have a job or, or to, to complete school or to he's never going to be able to have any kind of life because the damage is too severe. But you understand our university found out what had happened and everybody was praying for him. It's a picture of Derek with his wife. He married a couple of years after that. Uh, two of their three children. Derek has a thriving ministry to people with handicaps. He also goes around and preaches of the miracle that Jesus did in his life. Because not only did he get out of that bed and start talking to people and walking and doing all the things that you and I do, but God has used him mightily to bring people to salvation in the kingdom of God. Some of you are also a miracle of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I am. Because without him I was lost and I was hopeless. I want to ask you to consider the ministry of Jesus. Think about what he has done. Think about what you have heard. And think about your own life in that context. Because Jesus is still alive, and He is still working in all of us. And He wants, He wants to glorify the Father through each and every one of us. Consider the ministry of Jesus. Consider also the resurrection of Jesus. That's a big one, and I want you to think through this one with me, because this is actually a bit of a, a hot-button topic when it comes to you know debating about religion or debating about Christianity, especially talking about Jesus Christ with people. They always want to go at the resurrection, and they should. Bring it on. <laughs> what we all need to understand is that God loves us, but He hates sin, because sin destroys us. Sin hurts his children. Sin takes his children away from him, from him. Sin creates wedges. It breaks down relationships. Sin hurts us. And he hates sin for that. He hates it. Because he wants all of us to know him deeply, passionately, intimately. He wants us to live in his glory, in his love. And sin separates us from he hates sin. And that's why Jesus was born of a virgin. He didn't inherit that sinful nature that we inherit from our fathers. I'm sorry guys, but that's what the scriptures tell us. That sin is inherited through the sin of Adam and passed down from generation to generation to generation. I don't want you to miss the power of this one. On the cross, when the creation was mocking him, you understand the creation is mocking the Creator. While on the cross, at that moment, when they had all done their worst, when they had beat Him to the point of being unrecognizable, when they had whipped Him and shoved thorns on His head, and they had driven stakes, nails, Roman nails through His hands and His, and his feet, when Jesus 
hung on a cross, an instrument of torture, an instrument of death. As he hung there, Jesus looked up to God and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then after that he said, it is finished. I did it. It is finished. And into your hands I commit my spirit. And the earth went dark and it trembled. And a Roman centurion, not a believer, a Roman centurion looked up and he said, he voiced the words, surely this man was the son of they took him down off the cross, and they wrapped him, they prepared him, they put him in a tomb, they closed the door. The Romans put a seal, they posted some guards. And three days later, the door was open. And Jesus was gone. He had risen from the dead. Peter said it this way in Acts 3 and 15, you killed the author of life. <laughs> you killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are what? Witnesses of this. There were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. It's just something that just a story that somebody heard or was sitting around the water cooler at work. This, yeah, they didn't have water coolers. So this isn't just something that someone heard somewhere and passed it on. There were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People that saw him dead, saw him, watched him die, saw the dead body of Jesus Christ. Goes into a tomb, tomb's closed up, tomb is sealed, and three days later, they start seeing him walking around and talking to people. Come on, church, this is pretty amazing. I don't know what I would do. The zombie apocalypse is upon me. I don't know. Like, I would freak out. Wouldn't you freak out? Yeah. And you know what else I would do? I would tell every last living person I knew. Wouldn't you? Man. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. You know, skeptics and critics will say that, well... You know, the Roman soldiers probably stole the body. You ever heard that before? I've heard people say that. If you actually think that one through, that one's a little bit ridiculous. So first of all, to break the Roman seal put by Caesar was death. Right? Why would Roman soldiers take a body to perpetrate a myth that would cost them their lives at no advantage to them? <coughs> That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Just logically, it makes no sense. Some people will say, well, it was the disciples. They must have taken the body. And the problem with that is there were Roman soldiers guarding the thing. It's got a seal on it, this, this massive stone, and there are trained and armed Roman soldiers. So really what they're saying is, I mean, just if you believe that completely ridiculous idea, if it were true, right, that these bunch of regular guys just put one over on a bunch of trained Roman soldiers, this is the most powerful army on the planet. You understand that? Like, it's pretty messed up. But anyway, let's just say that, that, that you go there and you're like, no, no, I, I think that might be true. If you do that, then you've got to consider this. Even if that were true, what we have to consider is that for that to be rational, we're believing that 11 small town regular guys not only took over uh, and, and put these trained soldiers down, but these uneducated, average men devised the most elaborate scheme in the history of the world under the nose of the most powerful government and most powerful army on the planet, and then they pulled it off without anybody finding out, and then kept it a secret from everybody for the thousands of years. All of that with no personal motive. They didn't gain from doing it personally. And all of them had extreme loss. All but one of those disciples 
were executed for being eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. They went to their grave for that. The, the tomb was empty. Jesus was not there. He was not dead. You hear this? Consider the resurrection of Jesus. You know, what blows me away is Thomas. Remember Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Thomas, like, all the disciples, just after he rides from the grave, all the disciples get to see him, right? Like, he shows up at a party, and he's all like, hey, man, I'm Jesus. And they're like, whoa, that's crazy. And so, but Thomas is not there. He's off doing something. I don't know what he was doing, but he's off. And then he comes later, and the disciples are like, oh, man, you won't believe it. This is incredible. We saw Jesus. Jesus came. He was hanging out. But Thomas is like, yeah, I like you guys, but you're, you're all losing it, right? That's, that's not scripture, right? You know that, right? Okay. So... But Thomas is like, no, I, you know what? I'm not going to believe it unless I see it for myself. He had doubt. Regular guy. He's, just, he's looking at this thing. He's saying, that is like nothing I've ever seen, heard, or whatever, ever. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. I, I, I can't. I can't. I can't. Huh. Then Jesus shows up and he says, hey, Thomas, why, why don't you put your hand, why don't you put your fingers in here? Why don't you touch these wounds? Why don't you, I didn't do that, I'd scare everybody, but, you know, like, <laughs> put your fingers in here. See my wounds. Know that this is real. Don't doubt. Believe. And then Thomas, you know what Thomas does? Thomas goes to India, becomes the great evangelist of India. And while he's there, he's evangelizing India, they, they take him and they call upon, they strap him down, and they demand that he renounce his faith because nobody rises from the grave. And he refused. He said, I will never renounce my Savior. And they drove a spear through him. They executed him. They martyred him. Why would the one guy who clearly had doubts about the resurrection of Jesus Die for his faith. Because he saw Jesus. <laughs> well, this is good, man. You need to know the answer to this. Write that down. He died for his faith because he saw Jesus. There's no other explanation for that. He knows unequivocally Jesus is alive. Do what you want to me, but I saw the man. I spoke with him. Do your worst. Consider the resurrection of Jesus. Consider it. Don't consider Christianity. We make mistakes. Don't consider me. I'm, I'm imperfect. I might let you down. Don't consider this church. It's not what I'm asking you. Okay? We, we, we mess up all the time, don't we? Right, Don? Yeah, come on. Let's be real. Right? We're not perfect. I mess up all the time. We all do. But consider... Jesus, consider his ministry that he came for sinners. Consider the resurrection that eyewitnesses are willing to die because they saw Jesus rise from the dead. And finally, I want you to consider his eternal message. Consider the eternal message of Jesus Christ. I love the way Paul summarizes in Romans 3. He says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. We're made right with God by believing. We're made right with God by having faith in Jesus Christ. By putting our faith in the Son of God. This is, I hope you guys are hearing this because this is crazy powerful. I mean, there's nothing anywhere that's like this. We're made right, like in good standing, like awesome, son. You know, like we're made right with God. By placing our faith in Jesus. That's immense. It's huge. How were we made right? Come on now. This is like, it's Q&A. How were we made right? Yes. Yeah, that was, oh, come on. Let's do it. How were we made right? By placing our faith in Jesus Christ. It's like Sunday school, right? It's awesome. That's incredible. But here's the thing. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. No matter what you've done. 
No matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone, no matter what your life looked like yesterday or what it looked like this morning, no matter how shiny you think you are or how dark it was when you woke up this morning, it doesn't matter what kind of a track record or history or a testimony you have, it doesn't matter how bad you were, I was the worst of them. It doesn't matter who you were, it doesn't matter what you've done, because our God is bigger than that. He is more powerful than that, and it does not depend on your work. Your salvation does not depend on your work. Do you hear me, church? Their salvation does not depend on your work. Your salvation depends on His goodness, His power, what He's done, what He accomplished, what He's doing even now. It depends on Him, not on you. So it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter the life that you've lived. It doesn't matter the things that you've broken or the people that you've broken. It doesn't matter how ugly some of the things were that you did. Those things don't matter. I mean, that's awful. Don't get me wrong. I have great shame in my heart for many, many, many things that I've done in my life. I do. Maybe someday, if I'm really hard up for material, I'll give a, give a testimony. Then y'all won't like me anymore. <laughs> I don't know what your story is necessarily. I, I, I don't know all the things that you've done. I don't know what you did last night. Or even this morning before coming to church. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that your salvation doesn't depend on those things. Your salvation depends on your faith in Jesus Christ. Am I willing to give my heart to Him? Will I make him the Lord of my life? Will I, will I say, your way, not mine? Show me your way. I, I, I want to do that. I want to live that way. I want to trust you, not me. Everything I touch goes to pot. It's not about religion. See, religion is about me. Religion's not about him. Religion's about me. So it's not about religion. Religion's all about how I perform. It's about what I do. It's am I good enough. It's all those things. This is not about religion. Religion's all about me. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is relationship. It's knowing God. I know Tracy. My wife Tracy. I, there's, there's no one in this world that I know more than Tracy. There's no one in this world that I am closer to than my wife Tracy. I know everything about her. Sometimes when she's not sure about herself, she asks me. Because I know her really, really well. Right? I saw a movie once that talked about a relationship like a, like a degree system at school. Like, you, you know, some people, they get in a relationship and they get kind of like the high school knowledge of the other person. And some people, they take it even further and they get kind of like, like a university degree, right? They get that level of, of knowledge of the other person. And with Tracy, I, I, I'm all the way through, man. I got a PhD in Tracy. But I still haven't learned it all. I'm still learning about her. But man, I am really, really, really close to that one. I know her heart, I know her dreams, I listen to every story, every time, even when it's the ninth time. I've heard it. <laughs> because she likes to talk to me. Why? Because I'm hers. And I'm locked into that. I'm locked into her. I'll always be there for her. I'm always going to be with her. I'm always, like, I'm always looking for more of her. I want more. The longer we're together, the more I want. More Tracy. I want more Tracy. I don't get tired of being around my wife because I've, I've progressed to a point where I just, I'm, I crave Tracy all the time. I'm a Tracy addict. Does anybody relate to that? I mean, not about Tracy, hopefully. <laughs> Station after church because she's mine and you can't have her. But you should know her because you can have a high school diploma. Yeah. Can anybody relate to that? Having a relationship? Anybody that you just like, I don't know, is it maybe a friend or a child or a spouse or whatever, where you just, man, they're, they're everything to you. Ever felt that? 
Ever felt so overwhelmed by being with somebody that you just, you're lost? That is what the Lord wants with us. That we are so captivated by Him and so lost and in love with Him that we would know deeply and intimately how huge His love is for each and every one of us. That's His eternal message. He's saying, come and be with me always. Not just here, not just now, not just Sunday morning, not just, you know, when, when, when it strikes you or, or when you're, you know, it's, it's, it's not about the, the, the form and the, am I kneeling? It's not about like, how many times this day I've done this certain thing or anything like that. He wants us to know Him more than anything else. He wants that deep and forever relationship with all of us. And we have that. The door opens to that by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't, I don't even know what I wrote here. I got a couple pages of stuff that I'm probably not going to. Let's go close the book. <laughs> so I have no idea where I am anymore. I don't, I don't know what you woke up into this morning. I had, I had a bit of a week. I know sometimes I have to sort of examine myself and figure out where I'm at with him. You ever feel like that? I gotta kind of look in the mirror and say, man, man, I, I haven't been everything I should be in this relationship. Happens with Tracy too, where I'm not all the way there with her. So sometimes I gotta examine myself, and I don't know, maybe that's you this morning, maybe it's not. But I think it's critical, I mean critical, that every opportunity we get, we look at our relationship with God and then we ask ourselves that question. Am I desperate for you? Am I so, so in love with you that I would do anything just to get a little bit closer? Maybe, maybe you're one of these people, I, I meet them all the time and I, I mean, they love the idea of Jesus, but they've never just, they've just never, they've just kind of never taken that step. They've never just walked into it and said, yeah, I, I, I want you to be the Lord of my life, too. And salvation is a gift of God. There's nothing we can do to earn it. He's, he's giving it. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord, yes, I want that. I, I want you. Maybe that's something that you want to do this morning. Maybe it is. I don't know. I just asked you to consider this stuff. It's not my job to convince you. I love him, and I am passionate about him, and I wish for every single person here that you know him deeply and intimately, more intimately than I do. But you get to decide. You get to pick. So I would like to, I would like to take a moment. This is an alone moment with God. Okay, so I know I, sometimes I do this and it feels a little awkward and that's okay. We can be awkward together, can't we? Let's be awkward, okay? So I'm going to ask you to just kind of bow your head or close your eyes or whatever. Just take a moment to get into your own space with God. Whatever that looks like. Just sometimes I just close my eyes and lower my head a bit. Maybe you need to, the word is repent, it means to return to a higher place. Pent, like where we get the word penthouse. Pent is a Latin word that means higher place. Repent means to return to the higher place. It's just about turning away from things that we've been or things we've been doing or life that we were living and turn towards God instead. Maybe that's you this morning. Just, just something that's been hindering your relationship. Maybe you, you love Jesus, but man, I, I don't know about you, but I, I trip all the time and I make mistakes all the time. And sometimes I, it's like what Paul says in Romans. He says, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to do the bad thing, but I, I keep doing it. And I want to do what's right, but I keep doing what's wrong. And 
I don't know if that's you, but maybe that's you. Maybe you're the, one of these people that just, you've never taken that step and invited the Lord to be your Lord. Maybe you've never said, yes, Jesus, I want that. I want you, that gift that you're offering me. I believe. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you just want to draw closer. Whatever your story is, wherever you're at, in your heart, I want you to take a moment right now, just quietly in your own mind, your own spirit, in your own heart, pray this with me. Father, thank you for making the way where there was no way. Thank you for shining your light on me, Lord, and showing me the hope of your salvation. I may not know everything that it means today, Lord, but I do know that I want you. I want the gift that you offer. Today, maybe even for the first time ever, Lord, today I say yes, yes to you. I believe my heart, Lord, is yours. Give me that life, that more abundant life that Jesus spoke of. I receive it, and I thank you for it. Show me how you would have me live. And all of this I pray in Jesus' name. If you have never prayed that before, you did today, I want you to tell me just quietly, you don't, I'm not going to ask for anybody to raise hands or anything like that, but I'm going to stand at the back door after service, shaking hands and smiling at other people. I want you to tell me, please, because I want to celebrate with you, because that is an